Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, it's Kamar here with our fourth and our final, at least for now, final message in the Moving Picture series. I say for now just because we've been talking and this might be something we end up revisiting here in the future because there's so much, uh, so much to just get from this, so much to gather from this. Uh, if you're just now joining us, let's just talk about what Moving Pictures has been about. Uh, this series, if you recall, um, has been about this idea of a, a picture is worth a thousand words. You may have heard this statement before that says that if I can just have a picture, if I can have an image of something, I can turn that into so many stories, so many ideas, so many concepts, because a picture conveys so much to the person. There, is, there may be only one moment that I see, but there's almost an eternity in that moment. But what we've also been looking at is this idea that an image that moves can change your life. If the image moves you, right, we, we, we talk about this idea of moving pictures in, in the sense of movies and, and production and, and the idea of cinema, but really we're also talking about a picture that moves within you, within your heart, within your mind, within your soul. It's moving you as a person. And when it moves you, it changes you. And so we've been looking at all these different images we can see in God's Word, see in Scripture uh, that, that move you. And, and today... We are going to look at an image we find in nature. We're going to look at the image of the grasshopper mouse. This is something that I've been excited to teach. I've been holding on to this message for, honestly, almost six years now. I've, I've been excited to, to bring this out to people. It just hasn't been the time, but finally God says, okay, now, Kamar, now you can teach this. And this, this image that I see of the grasshopper mouse, I, I, again, it will change you. It changed me. It, it will change you as you understand how to see something in nature and realize how it conveys the reality of life in Christ. Uh, but before we get into that, I want to start with, with some scripture here. In Psalm 66, verses 1 through 4, we, we, encounter, we encounter a scripture that says, Shout for joy to God, all the earth, seeing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Selah. I'll say this, this is not the point of, of my, my teaching today, but, but whenever you encounter that term Selah in, in the Psalms, I love it because that's telling you to stop and reflect on the amazing things that have just been said, to stop and think about the beautiful thing about Christ, about God, about His people, about His world, about His Word. Think on how amazing God is. Stop, essentially, and break out in praise. And so we, 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 just, we get these first four voice, ver, verses in chapter 66 of, of Psalm, and, and we see we need to already stop and pause. And I'm going to have us look at this idea of shouting and praising, and we're going to look at the story of the grasshopper mouse. So the grasshopper mouse, this is a mouse that lives in the southwest in the United States of America. This is, this is a footage that I saw when I first came to Kentucky here. And, and, and you see this little mouse, it's, it's going through the desert here. And this is a scary place. I mean, you got spiders, right? You, 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 you say to yourself, this is not a good place for, for a mouse to live, especially a cute little mouse like the grasshopper mouse. I mean, look at that thing. That's a cute mouse. But, but it's not just that. You got, you got rattlesnakes, right? You, you've, got, you've got centipedes. You're going to see one here in a little bit. Here. You, got, you got centipedes. You've got all these poisonous things. In fact, the Southwest the United States has more poisonous creatures than anywhere else in the United States of America. And the grasshopper mouse lives there. Among those poisonous creatures, you find scorpions. Scorpions are deadly creatures. In fact, a scorpion can kill a human being. A scorpion can kill a man. And here's this little mouse stuck living in this world with, with these poisonous creatures. But the thing is that we call it a grasshopper mouse, but back in the day, they called it something different. They called it the scorpion mouse. And they called it the scorpion mouse because this mouse is not afraid. This mouse sees a scorpion and says, guess what, scorpion? You may be bad, you may be bold, you may have poison in you, but I am actually greater than you even. I am faster than the strike that you can offer to me. We're going to see that right here. Watch, he's going to, he's going to go after this mouse, he's going to try and take this thing down, and the grasshopper mouse says, you don't, you don't have anything on me, scorpion. I, I, I'm ready for you. And not only am I ready for you, but even if you do strike me, say, say your stinger hits me and, and gets into my skin, guess what? I'm immune to your poison. You can't kill me. In fact, not only can you not kill me, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to eat you. The grasshopper mouse is this little tiny mouse, and it fights, and it struggles, and it takes this thing, and it's victorious. And not only is it victorious, but look at what the grasshopper mouse does. Here is a little mouse howling howling in defense of its territory, howling to declare that I am victorious in this place, howling to say this is my territory, and I don't care what you are or how big or bad you think you are, this is where I live, this is where I reign. 
Now, when I first encountered this, it was just me and my oldest son. We were sitting there, and we were watching this, and I looked at him. My son's name is Manazi, and I'm like, Manazi, are you think what I'm thinking? And he looked at me, and he's like, yeah, Dad, I think I am. I'm like, this mouse is amazing. He's like, yeah, this mouse is amazing. I'm like, I'm like this mouse is preaching to me. He's like, okay, I'm not thinking what you're thinking, Dad. I'm like, I'm like I, there's a sermon here. There's a beautiful, like, like when I see it, he's like, no, I don't see it, Dad. I'm like, oh, well, I'm just going gonna, gonna to have to write this down, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this down, and we're going to talk about this later, because when I look at this mouse, what I see, what I see is a story about us and about our lives in Christ. See, this mouse, this little mouse was besieged on all fronts, outnumbered in a valley of monsters, but fearless. And that's how we're supposed to be. Living in, in this world that we are in now, surrounded on all sides by evil, by, by, by terror, but we're supposed to live fear, as a tiny little mouse, live fearless. Uh, in fact, we, we see this in, in Mark 14, I'm sorry, Mark 16. In Mark 16, we, we encounter this moment right before Christ leaves. Christ is resurrected. Christ is going to encounter his people before he leaves. And, and here we have here, in verse, starting in verse 14, it says, Afterward he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world. And proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs, these signs, these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God, and they went out and preached everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. See, see Jesus is saying, look, you, you made me a little sad because you didn't do what I wanted you to do right away, but that's all right. We're together now. You believe me now. I'm about to leave, and I'm ordaining you to a task, and you are going to to go out there and you are going to live in this world and you are going to be victorious in this world. He ordains us. Christ ordains us to be warriors in the valley of war. And so when I look at this story of the grasshopper mouse, what I see is God is preaching to us in nature. This is the moving image. See, sometimes we find the moving image in Scripture. Sometimes we find it in our relationship. Sometimes we find it in nature. But the beautiful thing is that God will use that to preach to us, to teach us, there is something I want you to know about living for me. And what he wants us to know, what we're going to look at today, is that, is that Christ has ordained us to be warriors in the valley of war. And so when I say this, the first question we have is, is how has he equipped us? If, if he's ordained us to do this task, right, then how has he equipped us to do this task? There is no way that we should ever believe that God would call us to a task that he would not equip us for. If he's called us to a task, he's going to equip us. If he's called us to be warriors, he's going to equip us with weapons of war, Right? Otherwise, he wouldn't call us to it because he is the good father. And so for everything he calls us to do, he equips us to do it. So how has he equipped us? Well, we see in Ephesians chapter 6, if you've ever studied spiritual warfare, you should be familiar with this passage. This is a very, very common passage that people look at when it comes to spiritual warfare. Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. That is, that is warrior language right there, right? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in change, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. See, see Paul is, is giving the, the, the church an understanding of what it means to wear this armor, what it means to be a warrior, what it means to be equipped for this fight. And, and the imagery he's giving is actually that 
of like a Roman centurion. I mean, this is Paul. This guy, he knows Roman soldiers. Why does he know them? Because he's constantly chained to them. This is a man who has been imprisoned so many times that even though he may not have ever gone to war as a soldier, he has been around warriors. And he knows what they look like. He knows what they carry. He knows how they carry themselves. He knows what they think about a fight. He knows how they carry themselves in war. And he's saying, that is us. That you and I, we have been ordained, we have been called, we have been chosen, elected, conscripted to this war, and we are been, we've been equipped as warriors. And so we have this list, and a lot of people have written so many books about this list of exactly what this is, exactly what that is. And, and, and really what I, I think is that sometimes people take this list, sometimes they take it too seriously, and sometimes not seriously enough. And, and, and they miss some of the point of what Paul is actually saying. See, when it talks about what we, what we have as soldiers in Christ, as soldiers who are warriors in the valley of war, what he's saying is that, look, you, you are held together in truth because that's that belt. You have, you have this righteousness from the inside out because the breastplate is on you, on the center of you, and that you are ready to go in peace. Why? Because you have those shoes on that are going to take you in peace, not have you sitting here. No, you're going to go in peace. Not just that, but you are defended in faith. Not defended in words, not defended in action, not defended in Bible knowledge, you're defended in faith. It is your faith that defends you. That you have thoughts that are guarded through salvation. Again, yes, you are in communion with other saints. You are definitely going to be embedded in the church and involved in the community of believers. But the thing that's going to guard your mind is going to be the salvation you've received in Christ Jesus. You are victorious in Christ. You're not victorious because your small group meets all the time. You're not victorious because you have a good marriage or you pay your taxes. You're victorious because you are in Christ Jesus. And also, you are constantly connected to the Father. A lot of people will, will end that reading of Ephesians 6 when they talk about, you know, oh, I have the sword and um, then I'm done. They don't see the part that goes on, Paul says, and praying all times in the Spirit. Because how are you going to be a soldier if you don't receive your orders? How do we receive our orders? Because we're connected to the Father at all times in prayer. We are never disconnected from the main source of what we're supposed to do as warriors. Why? Because we're connected to the Father through prayer. And so what Paul is saying is that, look, look, we have been equipped. We have been equipped. Okay, so we know... How? But why? Why has he equipped us? This is God we're talking about. He has angels. He has, he has all power in even less than his little pinky, right? Why, did, why has he equipped us? We may know how, but why? Why me, God? Why me? Well, Romans 8, 28, this is a verse that, that many people will sit there and quote like, oh man, you know, when things get tough, when, I, when I'm up against hardships and I want to know why it is that, that God has, has put me in a situation. They talk about Romans 8, 20. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Right? We, we say this all the time. We, we do. But I, I think sometimes it's good for us to go back and see what we find in Scripture elsewhere. Because in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 17, this is what we encounter. It says there, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So you might say, okay, where, where are you going with this, Kamar? I mean, okay, you're talking about being saved, being not. Bear with me. Because again, Romans 8, 28, it comes after Romans 8, 1 through 17. We got to see who's he talking to in 28. Pick it on verse 9. You, however, you, the you he's talking to in verse 28, the same you he's talking to right now in verse 9, you who's listening to me right now, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies 
through His Spirit who dwells in you. All right, so you, you're alive. Okay, you're not dead. I'm still not following, Kamar. What is this connection? So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. That same Father we're connected to in prayer. Here is that prayer. We're crying out to that Father in prayer. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Wait a minute. Heirs? Yes. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. See, here, here's the thing. This suffering happens, and it's horrible. And everybody says, oh, man, God's working all things together for good. He's equipped us to, to live in these horrible lives, and, and it's going to be good. Yes, but here, here's the reality of it. It's only for God and his people that this working out is a desirable outcome. Yes, God is doing this for our good. He is doing this for our good, but it is only for our good if we belong to him. Why has he equipped us to live as warriors in the valley of war? For our good, because we're his. But I, I, I want to caution you when you use that Romans 8, 28 thing, oh, God's working all things together for good. Yeah, if you're his, but if you're not his, I promise you that outcome is not fun. It is not pleasant. All things are not working out in a way that you would desire if you are not in Christ Jesus. He does this for our good because we are also heirs. So one of the reasons why he equips us, why he has equipped us and called us to be warriors in, in the valley of war is for our good. What's another reason he's done that for us? Well, if you, if you look in James, uh, James chapter 4, you, you find uh, that James is going on about the fact that we are supposed to be better than we were before, that we are not supposed to still be the sinful, messed up folk that we originally were, that we are supposed to be better. And then he goes on to say, starting in verse 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. That, that's, what, that's what James is saying. He's, he's saying that, that you have all these things that, that you can have, but it all starts it all starts with you on your knees before the Father. See, he has equipped us and called us to this life so that we can be strengthened, but the weight of this strength is down, not up, but down. You fall to your knees before the Father if you want to live. And James is reminding us that, that this warfare we have that we're supposed to be getting better in, well, it happens because we fall to our knees. And by falling to our knees, he does this for our growth. He has equipped us and called us to this life of warriors in the valley of war for our growth. That we may be humbled in Christ before the Father and equipped and strengthened in Him. Well, what's another reason He does this? Tomorrow? Well, we see this in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, um, I got verse 4 for you up there. I'm going to read to you verses uh, 3 through 6. Uh, in verses 3 through 6, it, it, this is what it says. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. But now you might have noticed that, that, that these are very aggressive verses we are looking at, right? right? We're going through Scripture and we're finding... These aren't, these aren't just, you know, wonderful, nice, soft verses. No, this is, this is aggressive stuff because war is aggressive. War is aggressive. And so when we're talking about being warriors, we're going to use aggressive language. God's going to use aggressive language as he's describing what it means for us to be his warriors. And, and this is not simple stuff. We're destroying things. We're taking things captive. We're confronting. We are dealing with things because here's the thing. This is not wishy-washy church members, but warriors who stand and know the word of the Lord. 
This isn't that guy who's sitting in the pew saying, well, you know, I came to church today and I'm having a great Sunday. The preacher preached and I feel good about myself and my kids sat in, in, their, in their children's church and left me alone and I feel good. And now, now I received a word to give me this, the, 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 to feel good about myself and go on and, and, and have a good week this week. That is not what this is about. If you think going to church is about making you feel good, you have missed the point. If you think going to church is about puffing you up so that you feel, feel better about yourself to, to confront this week that's coming before you, you have missed the point. You have no idea what spiritual warfare is. You have no idea what it is to be a warrior for Christ. You have no idea what your life is supposed to be. Because it's not about you feeling good about yourself. It's about you getting up off your butt, getting out there into the battlefield and waging war. See, he has equipped us not just for our good, but also for the good of the world. Because if we're destroying strongholds, we're making this world a better place. If we are taking captive the enemy, we're making this world a better place. He does this. He equips us. He calls us for the good of the world. What's another reason? Because there's so much. And, 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 and I could be here all day on this one. But when we look at 1 Peter... First Peter is one of those books that a lot of times people stay away from the Peters because they're so small that it's easy to miss them. But what I love about, about the, the books that, that, that Peter wrote, because he didn't write much, but Peter was a man who knew what it was to be broken in Christ Jesus, right? And, and what we find here in, in First Peter uh, chapter 5, I'm going to read to you uh, verses 8 through 10, actually. I know I only have 8 through 9 up there, but, but 8 through 10 is what I'm going to actually read to you. Um, it says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. I'm sorry, actually, that's chapter four. I'm verse uh, chapter five here. Be sober minded. There we go. Be sober minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, sinking someone to devour. That's the war we're in. That's the war we're in. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. He said, resist. He didn't say give up. He didn't say give in. He didn't say call it quits. No, he said, resist, stand, fight. And then in verse 10, and after you have suffered a little while, because you're going to suffer, because fighting a lion is not easy. Fighting a roaring lion is not some simple little thing. It's going to hurt. You're going to suffer. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. See, here's the thing. You're doing all this stuff because it is in empty vessels God chooses to pour out his love and power. It's, it's, it's weak people like us that God says, hey, great, I'm going to use you. I'm going to fill you. You're going to take down these strongholds. You're going to destroy these lions. You're going to win back your city. You're going to win back your country. You're going to win back his world because he has ordained you to be his warrior. See, God has equipped us for our good. He's equipped us so that we can grow. He's equipped us for the good of the world. He has equipped us for his glory. That's why he's done this. That's why he has made us to be warriors in this valley of war. Because at the end of the day, God uses little mice to bring down mighty demons. Little mice like me, little mice like you. All right, so this is... This is how he's, he has equipped us, and, and this, is, this is why he's equipped us. But, but what does this look like? Like, like, like what does this look like to, 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 to do this, to live this, to be this? What does this look like? Well, this is where it gets real serious. Because first of all, it's going to be scary. Because to, to live out this spiritual warfare life means I'm going to have to confront some people about their sin. I might have to sit there and confront my own father or my own mother or my own wife or my own sister or my own children or my, my own pastor even, unfortunately, about sin in their life because I'm a warrior for Christ Jesus and I have to take on every stronghold that God puts before me because that's why he put it in my path. Doing this looks insane. I mean, you remember... That image of a little mouse attacking a scorpion and then howling, that looks insane. That looks crazy. And so you might be that person who God says, I'm going to have you go and stand on a street corner preaching 
hell and salvation to the masses, even though other Christians are going to look at you and say, that guy doesn't understand the love of Jesus. And you know in your heart, I do understand the love of Jesus, but Jesus has called me to live the love for him in this moment by standing out here preaching. And I'm going to look crazy doing it, but I'm a warrior. It looks radical. Because people will tell you, you know what, hey, serving God means you got to make sure that you have certain money saved up. And God might sit there and say, you know what, no, I want you to go ahead and sell everything. As Jesus himself has said, we have it in Scripture that God might call you to sell everything and pack up and move. I know people who have done that, and it impresses me. It says, God has called me to leave and go to a foreign country to serve Christ Jesus because I love him. And it looks crazy, but you know what? I'm a warrior, and there's a war on. It looks bold. How many times did, did Paul talk about being bold, being bold, being bold? Even James talked about being bold, right? It looks bold. You know who it reminds me of? It reminds me of what we see in Joshua chapter 14, verses 6 through 12. I didn't look this one up in advance, but it's, it's okay because I can turn to it pretty quickly. Joshua chapter 14. This is a story that we have of the people are finally going to move in to God's territory. He has called them to live in a place, and they have been wandering around for so long, and Caleb's in there, and he's an old man, right? And they're like, hey, it's time to go in, and Caleb's like, oh, I got this. Joshua chapter 14, verse 6, Then the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, in Kadesh Barnea, concerning you and me? I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in my heart. But my brothers who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, yet I wholly follow the Lord my God. <laughs> He's saying, man, Josh, come on, you know how this went down. We loved him then. We were faithful then. And we're still standing now. Verse 9, And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, just as he said, these 45 years years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel walked in the wilderness. And now, behold, I am this day 85 years old. He's saying, I, and I haven't given up yet, and I'm not going to give up. I am still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then for war and for going and coming. So now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall drive them out, just as the Lord said. He was bold. He was a warrior. Because he realized that that's what I'm here for. That he gave me a promise. He equipped me. He called me. He sent me. I'm going to go. I don't care how old I am. I don't care how long it's taken. I'm going to go. Because I'm a warrior in God's army. Looks like being bold. Looks like being bold. And so... What I want you to, to, to see in this last uh, picture as will, right, is, is that even in nature, we can be moved. That this little grasshopper mouse, it should move you. It moves me to be a warrior. Because this whole story, this whole study of moving, moving pictures has been about seeing how God moves, how he moves us, how he teaches us, how he molds us so that we can be his people. I'll say this, too, because we looked at how, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words and an image that moves, right? It can change you. It can change your life. But don't forget this. We said this before, and, and this is something important to realize is as we're looking for these pictures, these images in our lives, you need to remember that in God's kingdom, there is no such thing as coincidence. So when God brings an image before your eyes, you need to stop and say, what is my father trying to teach me? What is he trying to show me? How is he trying to grow me and change me and conform me to the image of Christ Jesus? Because there are no coincidences in his kingdom. Everything is done according to his plan, according to his purpose, so that you too may be moved for his glory.